Welcome one and all to our September 2024 Adoption User Group. As always, this presentation is available for you to be able to go and see online. Um, I've got the bit.ly link there and the QR code that you can scan if you wish to. I've also put it into chat, so you'll actually find that it's pinned in the chat space. And uh, you'll be able to um, click on the link in there as well. The recording for this does go live at the uh, to about within the week, I suppose, at the end of the session. And um, we will make sure that um, we are all about. I'm just going to mute all because we've got a few that aren't on mute. I'm just letting everyone in, giving everyone a chance to come in. Welcome, welcome. Hey, there we go. Right. So, as stated, it is a recorded session. If you don't wish to be part of the recording, please feel free to drop off now. As I said, it will go live up on the YouTube channel after the session. I ask that we please stay on mute throughout this particular session to be able to help with the recording and speakers. If at any point with the speakers you do have a question, we've got Lorian, thank Lorian for coming in today, which is all very exciting. Um, please feel free to type into chat. I will pass on any questions that do come along for him in case he's not reading them um, and or you can ask me questions along the way as well I'll answer them as much as possible as I said you can always raise your hand to unmute if you need to as we go along happy to have questions it's always a little easier though to put them into chat I always give everyone a bit of a chance at the end of the session to be able to come off mute as well so we can do that then um, if you wish to you can turn on closed captions it will help with any accessibility and the fact that I talk really fast uh, might be able, might support you a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more as we as we go along or if English is your uh, second language I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're all meeting from today and to pay my respects to Elders past, present, emerging, and I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples who've joined us. I ask that we all be kind, welcoming, we use appropriate gifts, we're understanding of the fact that we all come at these um, with very different opinions around the topic of which I know Laurie and I often have some fairly deep and long abiding opinions on some of this technology and those opinions are our own and not representative of anyone else. Okay, um, My name is Kirsty McGrath. For anyone that's new, we've had a lot of new um, attendees coming along, especially with Laurie and being more in the, you know, technical space it's always good to see you come in i am an adoption specialist or use consultant i always start with a bit of what have i been up to a lot it was my birthday in the last month and i was really lucky to have it span over a couple of weeks i had family make me a cake before i had um i made my own very quick cake in amongst making a wedding cake as well as then a cake after with all of my walking buddies you can see here waking the wedding cake i flew all the way up to um, Cairns and then drove down to Indusfail and kicked off making a wedding cake. I'm classed as Auntie Kirsty to my best friend's children. We've known each other since high school. And so I got the, um, you know, you're doing the cake, don't you? So I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> so I had to fly everything up with me, um, bags and bags to North Queensland. But anyway, made it. And then, of course, whilst I was there, it was also uh, a little one's birthday cake. So I did a Dragon Ball Z cake as you do. So I had lots of fun birthdays and cakes and and uh, plenty more to come there. So that's all the, all the friends and family. Now, kicking in and getting started with our guest speaker. I'd like to thank you, Lauren, for coming along and speaking around Microsoft Planner and Premium and Project and what does it all mean? And, you know, I, I sometimes even can't get my head around it. I go, hang on, what feature is part of what now? Um, does it mean I have to? There's so many questions that have actually been rolling in around this and I do get asked lots of them. And I know that um, um, Lauren is very much a Across this, so I invited him along. He is a long term MVP in the community, a specialist across not only Microsoft Teams, but a lot of the 365 technology and running the um, Melbourne M365 user group. And I can let you go on a little bit more introducing yourself, Lauren. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Kirsty, and thanks for everyone. I will fire up my slides. Um, 
Let's hope Cherry. the technology doesn't let me down. I hope nice. can't display content. Ah, oh, spectacular. I love it when that happens. Let me just stop sharing mine. So now I'll hand it over to yours. I'll try again. Just in case. Ah, great. Can't display content. Fantastic. I'm going to have to do the old fashioned um, presenting screen thing. So yes, my presentation is too big. It doesn't allow me to bring the content in, unfortunately. Um, bear with me a sec. Oh, this is always fun. Just got to change the screen that I'm displaying things on. Right. Now, uh, where, is, where are you, Teams? Because I've got three monitors up, so this just adds to lovely confusion. I know. I have three monitors, laptop and mobile phone. <laughs> there we okay. go. All righty. Um, excellent. So we are started. So um, thanks, everyone, for your attention and for coming along to this session. This is a confusing one, um, I must say, and uh, actually to note that I'm actually wearing some very exclusive swag, um, which is the Microsoft uh, what is it, Path team, um, who are the team that actually owns Planner and Project and To Do. Uh, so I've got some lovely internal swag to show. And um, yeah, because people just go, what's that logo? Hang on, Mark. Lauren, you always wear Microsoft gear, as you can tell by this. Uh, so what is this logo? So yeah, um, so yeah, a little bit about me. I've been working for, with Microsoft Technologies for pretty much most of my career. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been working with 365 since it was called BPOS. Uh, so it's showing my age there. In fact, I think my previous photo had hair and a lot less weight. Um, but I worked with a lot of different organizations um, and the planner journey has been quite a, a tumultuous one um, across those as it hasn't always done the things we've wanted it to do in uh, different sectors from a compliance and governance perspective. Um, so just a little bit about me, um, I um, will be kind of speaking, shooting from the hip here because I actually don't usually do speaker notes. I like to tell stories as we go along. Um, I'm also autistic and ADHD, so um, you may need to watch some of this back and slow my speaking down. Um, uh, and also I'll be a little bit direct and blunt with the uh, commentary as I go. Um, so I try to maintain political correctness when I go with it though. Um, but look, there are opinions that are going to be in here. As Kirsty said, these do not represent uh, anybody's opinions other than my own, um, but they do. They are grounded in experience. Um, so what I first wanted to do was start along the evolution of project. Um, so quick thing, does anybody know when project was actually released? Feel free to put it into the chat. Any takers? Let's see how many people have got ChatGPT or Copilot. I'll search oh, 2000, 1987, close, that's not too bad. 1984, uh, so I have no logo here because the only one I could find was tiny and very pixelated. Uh, it was actually released, Project 1.0 was released on DOS in 1984, uh, but where we probably see it more commonly is probably more from the 2013 era as it became more available and uh, was added into the um, Office 365 uh, lineup. Um, we saw it kind of change um, and become more part of the a better part of the cloud service in 2019 um, with the fancy new logo. Um, and we started seeing more cloud only features of projects, such as we already had things like Project Online from the 2013 days. Uh, but we also started seeing the roadmaps feature, uh, which is available in cloud only uh, and not on prem. Uh, and then now we have the planner logo, maybe now. I don't know, but that's what we'll cover off today. Um, now, to do, I'm bringing into this because while it wasn't on the header slide, it is actually relevant. Um, so, uh, any ideas when to do became available? And bonus points if you refer to the predecessor of to do. Any takers? Silence in the chat. All right, I'll dig straight into it. So, to do actually came from an acquisition that Microsoft uh, had of a product called Wonderlist, which actually uh, originated in 2010. I can't remember the exact year they acquired uh, Wonderlist, but they effectively uh, took what Wonderlist was, stripped it to pieces, and rebuilt it as Microsoft To Do, which became available in 2017. Before that, we did have tasks in Outlook, uh, and effectively, To Do 
is actually tasks in Outlook. Um, it sits on top of it. So anything you do in uh, to do is actually stored in your Outlook tasks folder and vice versa. Um, and as you can see, huge logo change there in terms of the shading change to 2019. Um, and now we have this kind of confusion that to do doesn't exist anymore, or maybe it does, uh, which I'll cover off shortly. And then Planner. Now, Planner came out in 2016. Uh, it was originally called Project Highlander, um, and I had very early access to it, so it actually predates Teams. Uh, and fun fact, uh, when Teams was about to launch in 2017, March, um, the Teams team uh, went to the Planner team and said, hey, work with us, and the Planner team said no. So the Teams team then went and built their own version of Planner called Boards and went back to the Planner team and said, we're going to launch with our own product called Boards, which does everything yours does. Uh, so again, your choice, work with us. And they did. Always fun to have you know, uh, rifles pointed at each other within the same organization. Uh, so in 2019, Planner got the uh, the you know new Fluent UI um, logo makeover that a lot of them did, and now what we have is the new Planner, which yes is the same logo I used in Project because this is the confusion. What is the new Planner? Um, so before we dive into that, the thing we have to think about is what is the work management landscape. Now this slide is actually from Microsoft. Um, hence the fanciness of it. Um, but what we generally have as users is individual tasks we've got to do, then we've got team-based ones, um, and we work with those tasks in a variety of different ways. So some of us, like I'm old, uh, formerly Prince2 practitioner certified, so I love my waterfall um, project management methodology, especially being autistic. I love my exception reports and my um, uh, predecessors and requirements and all those kind of things and everything works in a logical order whereas people like Kanban and Agile and those kind of things uh, which causes me stress and anxiety so uh, this is where it's great that we can see things like uh, project slash planner adopting both of those um, and that's been a confusion that I'll talk about shortly um, in the project versus planner landscape um, but what we also do have is the project heritage which is not just project management uh, and many people when they actually use the Microsoft project desktop application would probably use about 5% of its capabilities. I remember doing a, a two day course on uh, project and within probably about the first hour I was already going, oh my God, I'm using features here that I've never used and never knew existed. Um, but it actually goes further and has the portfolio management, which is where we connect multiple projects to each other. Um, and can aggregate that. We've got that with Project Now. There is Project Online, as I said, which is a legacy service, but we actually have something called Roadmaps where we can connect to a variety of different projects within them. But it's one thing to have projects. We also need to have um, you know, accounting based on those projects. So we need to be able to connect data around how much these resources are costing us, how much this phase is costing us. Um, we need to be able to integrate with people's calendars. So Project has had um, some of this, but as I said, it's as an application, it's been quite quite a bit of a hill for people to climb. Um, so what we now have, as I'm sure many of you experienced, is lots of planner boards all over the place that people will go and start the, an idea or create a planner board and then potentially abandon it. Um, the other thing that's also confusing is every time you create a Microsoft 365 group, uh, which you'll get if you create a team, you also get a planner board by default. Uh, but a lot of people don't know that it exists because technically it doesn't until you look at it. It's like a tree falling in the forest. Um, but uh, what people will then do in teams is they'll go and create a new planner board because they don't necessarily see that, know that there's an existing one there. So they'll create a new one. And this channel will have you know, one planner board. Another channel has another planner board. And in many scenarios, that's right. But in many scenarios, it's just creating duplication. And if you go into the Planner Hub, you just see tons of Planner boards all over the place. So the first question to ask is, is Project dead? Any takers, any thoughts? Anybody want to have a guess? It's a yes, no. Beck, brave, yes. Joan, no. The answer is actually no kind of, not yet, maybe. Uh, there is a kind of evolutionary journey that we are going down. It's one thing I spoke about with the um, product group a while ago when they first started talking about this new journey of um, project and planner. 
um, was, hey, many of us have already been on a journey since 2016, 2017. Uh, with planner and to do and we've got that integration but it's not as rich as we'd like it to be so hey you're taking us on a new journey uh, and effectively what we're having is the merging of planner project and to do all into one now the thing that's important here is it's not as it appears on the outside because as i said they are very different solutions because to do as i said is your outlook tasks um, whereas Planner has historically lived in a hidden Azure um, storage um, location connected to your M365 group. Whereas Project, um, in the early days of Project Online, lived in a SharePoint site, um, but of late with using the newer functionality, actually lives in Dataverse, um, which is why we see Power Platform connectivity to it. Uh, but effectively, all of this is kind of being mashed into Planner-ish, kind of confusing. So one of the first things we saw is the um, the app known as Tasks by Planner in and To Do in Teams, quite a mouthful, uh, is effectively just now the Planner app, um, and that actually shows us what we saw before, just with a new skin, um, and adds a bunch of functionality to it. So next question is To Do dead? No, I'm not going to wait for you to um, answer that one uh, because no, it's not. Uh, to do still has a place as an individual task management application. And I actually had this conversation with the product group some time ago where we were talking about the standalone to do app uh, that exists on Windows, uh, web, um, uh, and also mobile. Um, should that be wrapped up into the new planner app? Now, I personally, with this answer that I gave to the team, was actually quite conflicted because if we're trying to follow the Teams app, which is all of them mashed into one, then in theory, or following the same logic, the to-do app should go away and I should just have a planner mobile app that includes my to-do tasks. However, as a person who likes to use to-do quite a lot for myself, I also don't want to see the rest of the stuff in there. I just want my to-do things. So at this point, to-do not going anywhere. Next confusion we have is, is the project desktop client dead? The other answer to that is no, there is way too much investment in that particular uh, product for um, uh, for many, many, many reasons. So what's that, 40 years um, of history, that's not going anywhere. Um, so yeah, important to note that for people who are still wanting to use waterfall and all those kind of things, that's definitely still there. Now, getting into the confusion part, the licensing. So we have Planner as part of Microsoft 365 E3 and E5, which includes things like um, your plans, boards, grids, all those kind of things. Um, and that um, licensing also allows you to integrate with what are project style plans in the Planner app. This is gonna get quite the tongue twister as we go along. Um, and you can actually interact with um, premium based plans, uh, but in a limited fashion, which I'll talk through shortly. Whereas the premium plans actually give us a lot more functionality. Um, so that's when you get into the um, pro, uh, planner plan one, project plan three, and project plan five, just to be confusing. Um, that's where we can do quite a lot of things. Now, one of the things that's quite um, important to note here is for many, many years, and I mean every year since its existence, people have said with planner, when will I be able to do um, uh, Gantt charts, to which Microsoft has always said, no, that's what Project is for. Conversely though, Project for a number of years has had Kanban in it. So in Project, you could do both experiences, whereas in Planner, you could only do one experience. So with the new Planner app in Teams, you can do both, and it doesn't really make a difference which one you're doing it on. So looking at this in a bit more detail, and I'm actually gonna spend some time, not on this particular slide, but going into um, the breakdown of them. Um, so yeah, the E3, E3, E5 license will give you the ability to edit, uh, create your tasks, to work with um, plans in M365 groups and to have all these different views and to look at some basic reporting. Then we move up to the planner plan one, which used to be the project plan one, but is now planner plan one, uh, where we can do obviously a lot more things from a project perspective. Um, 
in terms of, as I said, Gantt charts, and we can do sprints for more agile style. Uh, we can do resource management. So effectively project functionality. Uh, and then we move into the project plan three, uh, which is when we start getting the desktop um, software and portfolios and roadmaps and those kind of things. Uh, and then the plan five is your Rolls Royce um, experience. But this is, you wouldn't necessarily give plan five to every single person who needs to use project. Um, you need to look also planner slash project, plan object. Um, so you, that's where the whole thing is. You can mix and match license types um, uh, between users, depending on what their needs are. So from a licensing perspective, um, this is what we're looking at from a cost. Um, obviously your Microsoft planner, which is included in your Microsoft 35 license, don't have to pay for it. Uh, whereas your planner plan one is $10. This is confusing because usually your plan one is your entry level. So I guess we have to call the planner in Microsoft 365 your plan zero. Uh, Emma, I will come back to that question. It is one that is very close to my heart. Um, because if you could just take note of that uh, lists uh, question, please. Um, so yeah, your project plan three. So as I said, the um, planner plan one used to be project plan one, but they've made it planner. Um, and at this point, the project plan three and project plan five are still staying as project, um, but they will potentially at some point be renamed to um, planner as tends to be the way that Microsoft renames products. I don't know, from time to time, I suspect that there's like a secret room somewhere on the Redmond campus where they just decide to rename products um, for a specific, you know, at, at some time just to confuse us. So yeah, when we look into it in more detail level, um, your base to planner licenses versus your project licenses don't have your AI and copilot um, built into them. Um, but what we do, do have the ability to basically work with plans and um, even integrate with things like loop. The collaborations, we start to see a little bit more uh, difference between your planner license versus your planner plan one, which as I said before, your um, planner included in 365 doesn't give you uh, the ability to manage people's workloads uh, as that's more historically project resourcing uh, and also things like yeah, defining sprints and backlogs and all those kind of things. Uh, in terms of interoperability, they all uh, interoperate with all of the, the Microsoft um, 365 apps um, that are listed there, um, as well as a few more that aren't listed there. However, in the planning, we start to see again a bit more distant, a bit more difference there. So with the built in planner in Microsoft 365, we do have some templates, but they're very basic. Whereas when we start to move up to the plan one, um, we start to then see premium templates. Uh, and things like that. And as you can see from the bottom left corner, there is no Gantt chart view. Um, and yes, to Kirsty's uh, point, you need plan three for Copilot, but that's with an asterisk. I'll come to that at the end. Um, now, this is where we start seeing it to be quite um, different in terms of functionality because your planner has, a has generally been your ad hoc uh, team, lowercase t as in people, team uh, based task management, uh, whereas your project has usually been more uh, regimented. So here's where we start seeing some differences um, in the license types uh, and what functionality they pr um, provide. And then we also see it even more so when we come to, as I said, portfolio management, which is your higher end side of things, um, which is where we would generally use your project plan three, project plan five. Uh, in from a reporting perspective, um, we see um, the baseline, the base level planner plan zero um, has only view only um, uh, access to some of those reports that aggregate them. Um, whereas again, as we go higher up, we see more functionality. And then from the platform perspective, in terms of integrating with APIs, we can actually connect planner to other things. Um, and uh, we can connect it to Power Automate and interact with it there. And that's something that's been a bit of a difference because Power Automate will work with Planner, but there's more things that we'll do with it in the higher up um, license side of things. Um, again, from a security compliance perspective, this has been my bugbear uh, in that 
and where are you? Um, actually, it's not on this slide. Um, the historically, and actually still to date, um, planner, the free one or the included one, has no version history, has no um, uh, has no audit log um, that you, end users can access. Whereas that is something that um, project has had. So what we'll now start to see is yes, you can have that functionality in planner if you have the higher level of license. Um, that is actually the main reason that historically I have said ditch planner and use lists because of the fact that lists has version control, uh, version history and individual permissions. Whereas planner, uh, if you go and delete somebody's task or the planner board, good luck. Uh, whereas in project, that's not been the case. So a few things to be aware of. Uh, the integration with Viva goals that I mentioned earlier, you'll need Viva goals. Um, where this is uh, quite handy is in um, planner boards, we can have goals within them, but we can actually connect them to uh, Viva goals um, as well. Um, the integration with Power Automate, you will need a Power Automate subscription. Um, which most people generally have as part of their Microsoft 365 license. Um, now, Copilot and Planner. Yes, is available in Plan Project Plan 3 and Plan 5, but that is only during preview, which they're in at the moment. Uh, they have not actually identified what the cost might be for Copilot in Planner um, or whether it would require a Copilot for Microsoft 365 license. So I know I came here to clear up the FUD, but unfortunately some remains, uh, which we'll hopefully see um, as the roadmap matures. Now, one of the things that really, really, really annoys me um, is if you go to Planner in Teams, you get one experience, but if you go to Planner for the web, you see the classic experience that was there. So if you've created any smarts in the Planner in Teams um, app, um, you won't see them in Planner for the Web. The other thing as well that uh, has been an issue for many, many people for a long time, myself included, is in Planner, you have never been able to create a plan just for yourself. You've only been able to have a planner board connected to a Microsoft 365 group um, and you know, by extension a team. Um, this has been quite annoying as many people want to use, you know, the, basically the Kanban view of, um, of Planner, but they don't want to necessarily have it in a group um, that everybody can see, or they don't necessarily want to create a group just for that to, um, to exist. So in Planner for Teams, we can actually create them, but in Planner for the Web, you won't see them. How much fun is this? Uh, so what we'll see is when we go to the um, Planner for the Web, you see that hub. Uh, that hub view is no longer there in the planner app in Teams. Um, we more see um, just the listing of them. This is kind of becoming more of a consistent experience. Like with the new Teams um, view where we can see all the teams will show up in more like a table style of things. I think maybe we're gravitating away from graphs and big buttons. We just want tables of data. Now, some good news on the horizon is that from October, um, the planner for the web will actually become like the planner in Teams. Um, so it will actually be the same experience um, regardless which interface you go to. So fingers crossed, and as I said, quite a frustration. I would have kind of hoped that they would have released the two at the same time. Um, not sure if Amit has a question there, which is why he's off mute. Um, but yeah, so um, uh, yeah, that as I said, quite surprised me that they released one and it's been a number of months that the two of them are different, which I think is a not a great end user experience. Um, now, there are some resources to go to, um, which uh, fellow MVP Heather Severino provided me uh, in prep for this, because I'm not sure if Kirsty has said, I had all of what, five days to prepare this session. Um, Sorry. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so, now I'm happy to also show you a demo um, uh, shortly of We've Copilot. got a couple of questions, Lorian. Yep. Do we want to oh, come back to a couple of the questions? Yep, we'll do that and then demo. Um, so so we've first? got, does Microsoft List fit into this picture? So unfortunately, no. 
um, which is why a number of years ago, I actually wrote an article saying it's time to turn planner off and even wrote then follow-up article on how to migrate your planner boards to lists because when lists introduced the Kanban view, that's when I went, cool, don't need planner anymore because the frustrating thing is with a planner board, if I assign someone to a task, they have to be part of that M365 group or team. Um, where this was especially frustrating is for the um, unaware that if somebody wasn't a member of the team and you uh, added that person as a um, to a task in the planner board, you would add them to the team. So now all of a sudden they would see everything that maybe they shouldn't see. Um, we also weren't able to put planner boards into um, private channels and shared channels um, because technically those are separate things in SharePoint and Teams and not connected to a group. They're just kind of like virtually linked. Uh, so yeah, the planner board couldn't understand what group it was coming from. Um, so look, there is still absolutely um, value in using lists because lists can display like a Gantt chart, it can display a Kanban, it can display a calendar, all the things that Planner can do. Uh, it has the version history, those kind of things. Um, but we've got, I think, just probably a lot more formatting controls that we can do um, around, sorry, that's my phone. Um, we've got a lot more um, planner controls that, uh, sorry, a lot more formatting controls that we can apply to um, to a SharePoint list. Um, and as I said, we can give access to an individual item in a SharePoint list uh, without people having access to the entire list itself. Uh, so yeah, it unfortunately doesn't fit into the picture. Um, the other thing as well is lists in the earlier days, you used to be able to synchronize them to your Outlook. That feature doesn't exist anymore because what you could do is have like a list that was like a calendar and you could synchronize that and show it up in your Outlook calendar. But no, we can't do that anymore. So sorry, that's a shitty answer. I mean, sorry, that's a poopy answer. Um, <laughs> and I don't like it. The so. next question is, uh, and I don't disagree with you on that one, without a doubt. Um, can you use see the project plan three five features? So for the to the two different plans in the planner app, or is it just the project desktop only? The answer is yes and no. Yeah, um, depends on what it is. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. Because as I mentioned earlier, the project desktop app is incredibly feature rich. And so not all of those features uh, exist in the planner app. Um, so yeah, there are some things that will show up there. And that's the thing is we, if you haven't used project, um, not with project online, but with project for the web and project desktop client, um, you could actually synchronize the two of them. So you could work in project desktop and then synchronize it up to the project plan. Um, so that functionality remains and there's a lot of things that we'll be able to do also in the planner web uh or sorry planner app in teams that we can't do in project desktop um so yeah just a continually disconnected uh experience uh but i guess it's the same for many apps you know you can do more things in outlook desktop than you can in outlook on the web and definitely that piece of junk called outlook new that's all I can see in the questions, but um, a demo would be fabulous. All right. Let me change the sharing around and I'll go into the planner app in Teams. And I will just reshare. Lovely. So can everyone see my screen? Can indeed. Super. So this is the new planner app. What we see is this lovely like to-do-esque interface um, where we can see, you know, what I've got on. Uh, we can also see my tasks that come from uh, various, uh, so this is showing assigned to me and this is the usual to-do-esque functionality uh, versus I'll see everything. And uh, it'd be nice if it showed me like a total count so I could just go, oh, I'm going to go hide now. Uh, and then we can see my plan. So we've got you know, this similar experience that we're seeing in a lot of the apps um, now where I'll see the shared ones, the personal ones, the ones in the different teams and those kind of things. Um, now, when I create a new plan, um, because I have the relevant license, I see a lot more templates. Um, and so, you know, as usual, we can start with a basic plan. But what you can see here is add to group is optional. 
So that allows me to create a plan that is just for me. Um, I won't do it because it actually takes a little bit of time to generate. Um, but we can also see a premium one here will just take you straight to it. It's just that it will have premium features. Um, or we've got a bunch of templates and I don't know about others, but I do not like the UI that they've started doing with some of these logos. It's just inconsistent with the rest of Office. This kind of like what a 3D embossed type look kind of feels a bit, I don't know, 90s, you know, CD-ROM type look when they started doing ray tracing. Um, but we can see things like if I do sprint planning. So we can see here that this is a premium plan versus if I look on some of the other ones, you can see here, this is actually both basic and premium. Um, and you can click between the experiences uh, and this will show me more functionality. So I can then use those templates and there's a whole bunch of different templates here, but kind of like with list templates um, and some of the loop templates, a lot of it is for show. It's just a bunch of columns that have been created and maybe some views, um, but Fundamentally, it's still the thing, the same thing behind the scenes. If I look at marketing campaign, you know, it's just changing the different um, views there. But you can see this one is premium only. Uh, so if I go into this test plan here, this is where I can start using Copilot. When it loads sometime today. Right, that's why we need to hold music. There we go. So you can see here up the top, I've got a lot more things um, that I can um, provide. I can look at um, the board view. Uh, good question, James, if you have a basic plan, can it be converted to a premium plan? That is a good question. I will actually have to come back to you on that. Um, I would actually think that a basic plan is just the template, but it's the functionality that I have based on my license, but I'll Come back to you on that one. Um, so yeah, the board is your usual, you know, Kanban style, but we can now start seeing the timeline here, which is if I scroll back far enough, yep, keep going. Oh, well, there's definitely some dates. I think I've just somewhere in there. No, I thought I had some dates in there. Can zoom out. Oh, I've not put any dates in. Um, but you'll see here that I start now having, if I hover over, I can assign the task. Uh, I can also, if anyone's used project, you'll start seeing that there's a lot of uh, more options here. So if I click on open details, uh, I can now start putting in the duration, the complete. So things that you see in Microsoft project um, that currently aren't in planner and then things like dependencies. So a dependency on a previous um, task uh, and those kind of things. And yeah, connected to Viva goals. And here, look, task history. Several months ago. That would be nice if it actually said how many months ago. What's several? Does actually anybody know what's the maximum amount that several is? Is it when you go beyond single digits? Um, yeah, so you can see here that we've got a version history, which is fantastic. Um, and get rid of that. Seven? I would have thought seven is seven, whereas several is... More than a few, but less than many. I'm sure, there's a dictionary somewhere. Um, your charts is the the same kind of charts that we've got here, but we're also seeing now effort per person because I can track the effort in the tasks themselves. Um, see all the people who are assigned to different tasks, um, goals if I had connected it to there, and then also any assignments. Now, the thing that you probably want to see is if I click on Copilot. Now, Copilot, and I don't know how many people have used Copilot in different Microsoft 365 apps. In some apps, Copilot's not that fantastic. Copilot in Planner is actually quite good. Um, where let's, what have we got? Onboarding, offboarding. Let's, um, let's uh, add, uh, add some tasks to do with post offboarding stuff clean up um, such as IT equipment, uh, accounts, permissions, clients, etc. And let's see how it goes with that. As I said, this has actually been generally pretty good. This is this will be where it fails and tells me, oh sorry, we're in preview. 
So one happens. of the questions I did ask sort of a clarifying was, if you have a basic plan, can it be converted to premium plan? And it's like, well, at any point you can upgrade, but I, I'm not sure if the question is, if you've started with a basic planner, can it be upgraded to the to the premium if it's already been started as a as the kind of the older version? Yep. Yeah, so that's the bit that I haven't played with myself. But um, as you can see here, there was the offboarding staff, and it's now added a whole bunch of things here. So I've just given it some examples. So this is actually a really good co-pilot where it's done some of the thinking for me. Um, so very, very useful here. Um, yeah, and now I've look, look I've got co-pilot for Microsoft 365 and Project Plan um, 5. So I've got all the bells and whistles. Um, so I haven't tried this out with someone who uses Project Plan 5 without Copilot for M365, but I suspect that the Copilot in here might be like the Copilot in um, in Power Apps and Automate, where it's separate to the Copilot in M365, um, but we're yet to um, yeah, we're yet to see that. Um, clarity. So, yeah, as you can see, Copilot actually quite good. Um, and then, yeah, the rest of the functionality is just like it would have been. Um, let's see, give me the status report for this plan and any date associations. Let's see how we go with that. And what's really good is I can actually tell it to go and, you know, add more functionality or add more tasks to the client account management and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's actually quite good there. There we go. A little bit of, well, I mean, this is a test plan, so it doesn't really have any information in it. Question is, how hard is it to add external email accounts? Can you actually collaborate externally with the with premium, with your plan? Um, we can, like we can with Planner now. So that functionality remains, um, but they will then obviously not see the same you know experience that we the licensed user might um they'll effectively have the included in microsoft 365 um license equivalent the thing just to be mindful of that though is when a guest can access as a plan um they will basically have the same rights as you do so they can go and delete tasks and all those kind of things and if you're only licensed for the basic one uh, version of history um so but yeah it, it for that plan to work it would actually have to be connected to a microsoft 365 group and the guest actually has to be in, in uh, invited into it because right now uh this plan is private to me the moment i click share um and i just want to add anybody to it i have to add to an existing group or create a group so that's where your guest will go If I add, assign this to someone, if I say Gavin, I'm going to try this on a private plan. Theory, there we go. So it's saying no, it hasn't been shared, so add it to a group. So the moment you invite somebody. Uh, so to answer your question, Beck, the, is there a way to add non members to a plan? No, the moment you add someone to a plan, regardless where it is, it will add them to the group that is connected, that the plan is connected to. And if it's not connected to a group, it will tell you to do it. Um, if so I yeah, just assign it, they will need to be a little be careful on that one because all of a sudden they'll have access to files, conversations, the whole oh, yeah. lot. So it's one, it's, it's, either, it's either or, Beck. Yeah. So that's the thing is here, while you can see just assign, um, if I don't add it to um, a group, they will not be able to see their assigned tasks. So if I assign it to someone and don't actually add them to the group, then yeah, they're not going to see it. And the eye can see that it's assigned to them, which is kind of pointless. Any other questions? Not seeing, 
Not seeing any more questions there. Super. Well, with that, I'll just put up my closeout slide. Just once again. Uh, so if you've got any details, reach out to me um, via the Twitter. I refuse to update it and put an X logo there. Uh, <laughs> or if you go to um, yeah my blog, laurianstrand.com. Um, yeah, I'll be. I'm, I think I see from from a bit of an adoptions perspective, Lauren. I think I see people um, uh, quite enjoy the planner premium features, where they they I think it kind of simplifies that interface, where they struggle with project and it's too much and it's a little overwhelming for the average individual. You said you could go do a two day course easily, to do in three days to run three day courses in Microsoft Project, and it it's full on, but it gives that a bit of a light aversion for the average individual, but it's still got the cost of the bigger product, which can then be a bit of a, a stopper for some businesses. It's only those that need it would ultimately have the license and others can still use the planner original basic plan look. It does. And actually what I'll quickly show you is what the roadmap actually looks like, uh, the roadmap functionality for those who haven't seen it. Um, so this has been around for a while. So I'm just going into project on the web. Um, and you can see here that I've got a number of projects, but you can also see this one here as a roadmap where what I can actually do in it is um, I can, if I click on uh, add a row, I can actually connect it to a project plan. And this is effectively gives us that pro program management where we'll then aggregate all of those things. Um, into a uh, a bigger view. Um, so yeah, and it's pulling that from basically every group that I've got access to where a project might exist. Um, so yeah. If there aren't any more questions, thanks for that, Lorian. If you're um, able to provide the presentation for everyone, I know they always, it's the very next thing they ask for, um, and I can put a link into my presentation for them for you. Absolutely. Do you want me to upload it somewhere or just stick it in my OneDrive uh, just, and share it? Yeah, just, just share it with me. That would be fabulous. Um, we have sure. just a question that's just come through. Can I see tasks I create in Planner in Project Desktop? So the question there is if you've created the task in Pro... Oh, sorry, hang on. If you create the task in Planner, can you see it in Project Desktop? Yes. Uh, yes. If you... If it's a premium plan and you open it in project the the desktop client uh, you've actually which, got to open it to the to the desktop client to do it yeah um mm. because project desktop client is still quite clunky um because it used to be out there in fact you can still connect it to a sharepoint list and create a gantt chart in microsoft project and publish it to a sharepoint list um but yeah it does connect to the project for the web service which is planner oh my god my head hurts with this so and, uh, yes. clearing the fud. <laughs> the uh, problem is it's not unfortunately it's i'm clearing i should have changed the title to be clearing some of the fud some of the fud <laughs> uh, the journey it, it is it is thank you for that laurian appreciate it and i'll uh i'll kick back over unless we feel free to um hang around for Hang around for a moment. Maybe some more questions will come up in chat. You never know. I'll swap over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's just share my desktop. Come back in. Okay. Moving over to what's new in adoption and off the back of that, uh, Lauren, so I thought I would put, put in here the YouTube channel, the, you know, meet the new Microsoft planner, lots of great videos in there that they've actually been updating over many months. I think the last one was only a couple of months ago, but it does talk um, and it does go into a bit about the premium throughout that. What does it look like? So it might help a few of you if you do need it. 
Um, the other thing is I just wanted to remind everyone because I do get a lot of people going, you know, is this coming or is it there or I can't find or they want to provide feedback. You can go in to the uh, Microsoft Feedback Portal, which is the feedbackportal.microsoft.com so that you can actually provide feedback on any of the features. <laughs> so you just find the particular product um, and you can go through, go and have a search and see if it's something that's actually been put in there previously and you can upvote it and it stays on the product manager's radar. So, you know, I'd be getting lots of, lots of how do I on this. Um, there was, a, technically it was stating there was no August champion call, but there was an August champion call. I'll come to that in just a second. It hasn't actually been put up on the champions resources, so we do still have only the July one sitting there. Um, they were taking a break only because um, they wanted to do, they're doing a platform changeover, by the way. So that's kind of why. So I'll show you what they're doing now. The next call, which is coming up in September, the topic is actually OneDrive for Work. So if you want to keep an eye out on that. Um, always fabulous what's going on across the adoption space. The team kind of gave come together and do a bit of a highlight with a guest speaker. So um, what uh, uh, what actually happened was they were testing the new broadcasting platform. So it's gone over into YouTube. This is how it's actually going to be run for the Champions Community Call moving forward. Um, you can go and have a watch of that. They've got a bit of a, a chat going on. What are they doing? How are they doing? Um, so one to, one to keep an eye out for and where it's actually running now. Okay. Um, uh, another one that's just come up recently was Caruana went through and she did a presentation on Coffee in the Cloud around some power skills that you might need to present adoption plans to your leadership. Now, it's not a particularly long video. It's really she's got kind of her top three hints and tips around how to actually get in as a user experience specialist, which is what Microsoft's kind of calling us in the adoption space these days now, kind of in the user experience. I don't know if it's really kind of taken off yet we'll see how we <laughs> see how we go on that one but a good one to watch and a quick one now as part of that she also recommends going in and having a look at the community skills channel these are different power skills for user enablement now it's quite extensive there's a lot of videos that are actually in there the very first one is based on kind of nine modules which is around about six hours and then there's a whole heap more different things that have kind of been pulled together for user enablement to be able to help and support you on your journey if you want to slowly start kind of working your way through this as so there's some recommendations. Um, always kind of go in and have a look. And if you haven't bookmarked it yet, you can go in and bookmark the um, news desk when it comes to the community. There's lots of great community news that's actually being dropped in there. Um, some things like, um, you know, understanding what's going on across the community learning channel. There are so many videos that are going live. This is even just not even a start of the last month of all of the, the, the videos that have gone live from MVPs and community members and developers, lots of fabulous topics in there. Um, one in particular that I would highly recommend going and watching, I'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute, but the digital safety in terms of um, Viva Engage. Great session that I actually went along to. Um, they've stated that they're going to put the presentation live up on the adoption site. It's not live yet, um, but I will advise the moment we've got it up there. So another one that recently came up, there was a um, Viva community call that's um, that's uh, happened not that long ago around high-performing organisations in the era of AI and what that actually looks like. There was a couple of um, white papers and other information that I'm going to put in here fairly soon. Um, good video to work your way through from the uh, latest research from the science team um, and the ebook that actually has come with it. So the digital safety webinar moderation, here is the link for it. So I've dropped that in. Um, the team brought up some really good uh, features and functionality, um, recommendations, some different things that have come along that's all kind of collated into the one video. Now, some of the other core cool components that I'm seeing coming through, there's the discover the power of co-pilot prompts. So um, Carolina, who is an MVP, so she came in and there is a, um, a, a fabulous 
a document that she's actually put together. I really like this ebook. Um, one to go and have a bit of a read through. So there's some recommendations. There are personas in there and how they're actually doing, including the likes of Mark Cashman. Um, so what are the different prompts that she's got, different MVPs and, and Microsoft employees, and what do they do and how do they do it? So some really good stuff in there in terms of prompting. Uh, some of the latest work lab guides around AI, a few that I've actually bought up before, but most of them that are coming through, what we're seeing is some of the previous kind of uh, white papers slash um, guides are all kind of being pulled together underneath one platform, making it so much easier for us to be able to find our content. So always recommend going and having a look at some of these. And one of the lungs that I, one of the ones I do like was this anatomy of Copilot. Um, so I would go and have a look at some of the stories that some of the insights that have actually come from some of this data, some really good information in there. Uh, another one was uh, five co-pilot prompts to go and try out at work. Some good little prompts in there to be able to help and support you along the way. Um, those prompts to try out at work off the back of that. Two core things in there that I particularly liked was a graph that actually shows the percentage of respondents and what they actually mention in the use case and how they use it and what are the things that are getting people's interest. So if you're going out and you're looking at, you know, what are we, can we put first and foremost to try and grab their um, attention and do some training on and, you know, these are the things that they're actually talking about an awful lot. So in the in an order, so if you wanted to kind of run in that order, you might be able to look at them in terms of their learning profile to run your way through and start with meeting, okay? Uh, another one is the um, uh, over on the right-hand side, a great prompt in there around doing some uh, analysis. Uh, I just thought I'd drop this one. I particularly liked it. Another one, the impact of AI on business, looking at the specific numbers. Now, one of them in there was, um, and it's got three different companies based on, you know, what have they done, some of the measurements that they've actually done. One in particular, and the measurements that came out was they had the 10% reduction in emails, 20% um, in terms of being able to get out of meetings a little earlier because you're working a little better and more efficient, that there was a 73% boost in their document creation, which meant they were spending more time on high value content that was created for their clients because they were focused a little better, not on the the, the, the minute <laughs> of their, their documentation meetings and emails, so letting Copilot do it. Now, the release notes in terms of Microsoft adoption, sometimes there are some broken links that are actually in there. I generally report where I'm seeing some problems back into the team on these links. So cross fingers, they are getting fixed for you. Um, last month, I talked about the fact that in the scenarios, the change management um, presentation that you could pull down for the, so the persona scenarios was broken. The link is still broken. I have given them a reminder to go, can we actually fix this? So it's still unfortunately broken. But cross fingers, something will happen soon. Um. Okay, um, there was, in terms of the Inside Track blog, there's a driving co-pilot with M365 with the co-pilot champs community. This was how did Microsoft actually do it and some of their key takeaways, some um, really good information in there on how they've actually done it in terms of the Microsoft's journey. So one to have a little bit of a look at if you want to look at the way they set up and the mentoring and the engagement and how they drove it forward with with their um, with their environment. Another one is unlocking the potential for co-pilot down to the role level. Now, this one um, I particularly liked when it came to and it drove into some of the executive pieces. Now, this here, you'll see it talks about some of the different roles, but there's this kind of a little piece here, and I'm going to do on the next page. I'll talk to it a little bit more. There are some um, ebooks. One a much bigger one and one a short, sharper kind of version of the ebooks. But 
on this particular page is some key takeaways that might actually help and support you when it comes to building out your program. You know, some of these cool little cut pieces, there might be bits and pieces you take. A lot of times I find it's stuff that I sort of will be doing myself anyway. And, and it's just kind of, I'll just do a quick skim through, go, yep, 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 not doing all of that. But if you're not familiar and you are somewhat new, some really fabulous content in there to be able to help you drive forward. So in the um, M365 for execs, it's actually got this ebook. So the ebook here, when you go in, it's got this 27 page ebook that you can actually provide to your executives. It will help them on their journey. So maybe you are going in and you're, and when you look at caravanas, you know, three top tips, maybe you want them to read something before you go in and present so that you can be really succinct around how you're actually going to work with your executive engagement. Okay. Um, some great content in there. There is a full book overarching version in terms of a deployment and um, in there is some of the it's got some of the more technical I suppose as well um, but I do like the executives it tends to lean I suppose a little bit more towards us and some of the work um, trends uh, and your report that we've seen and how it can be pitched towards the executives a bit more. Uh, there is as part of all of the links across and I think what I like about a lot of these you know white papers or reports or ebooks that come out there's often links off the back of it so if you go through and you start clicking some of the links when we kind of drive down we sometimes see some of those um, scenarios that can kind of help us and they kind of pop up and sometimes they're not on our adoption site but you might find them elsewhere where it can actually be other teams that are even doing it so I do like that um, uh, sometimes the other uh, teams might put up what they did in their perspective or other presentations that we see that we can actually download and use content from. So in this particular one, it has some top hero roles um, in this particular playbook, and it's got an overarching, you know, what you can do and how you can do it as, a, as just a general. Now, one of the teams that I was talking about where I found some content there is the MCAPS um, team when it comes to how they were driving out their co-pilot adoption strategy. And it was for kind of the partner community, the wider um, community across sort of Microsoft and what they were doing and how they were actually doing it. Um, this adoption in a box components. Now, a lot of this is driving forward into what we see on the adoption side, but I do like some of the information that was actually in there, including a few of the things that they actually was kind of their learning outputs. A lot of times we see this elsewhere, uh, but, and, and, uh, it, are the, it is often things that we will do potentially anyway, but, you know, it's always some good pages that we could draw from. If you don't want to, don't reinvent the wheel, guys. There's so much content out there. I think that's the main thing I'm saying here. So much fabulous content. Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, another one that's come out, there's a template for communicating with the employees about Copilot for M365. Now, this was a, um, like the comms team putting out some content. Um, it's more of a, it's sort of a, uh, like a guide white paper sort of thing around copilot employees and different things that they've done in different places, such as what have they said and where have they said it? Uh, so this, you know, did you know, and this was a post that they've actually gone and put up, okay, and how they've done it. So just some light, um, easy ways that you can just drop some content elsewhere. Now, a lot of this content that I'm actually grabbing, you can find throughout the how does um, Microsoft do it. It's on the Microsoft Adoption site. So if you haven't seen it, you can go in. It's at the Microsoft Stories, and there's lots of really great links in here. A lot of them I am providing over the, you know, over a period of months, I've kind of dropped different links, and as they build out, um, they are all collated together, and this is where you're going to find them if you want to go in, including things like, you know, adoption guides for the executives and then there's that MCAPS one. So what they're doing is they're kind of pulling information, things that they're doing internally and slowly loading stuff in. If you want to keep up to date, this is where you'll go. One of those is that there are um, the state of AI change readiness ebook. So the video, the YouTube video that we saw a little earlier is off the back of this book. 
So if you want to go and have a look at the ebook, you can start to go in. What does a high performing organization, what does it look like from someone that's not kind of classed as high performing when it comes to AI from one to the other? And what's that look like in terms of internal productivity, for example, um, their feeling of um, employee engagement and satisfaction and how they're doing it? So there are some there are some um, nice little sort of charts in there and really good understanding of how they've kind of realized their value by using AI. There, off the back of that are some four key findings that they've got. So it was a blog post that went up that grabs a couple of the findings. Um, I... Uh, look, the, the four key findings go, yeah, but there was a few other things in there that I particularly liked. One of them that I really liked was these personas that they've actually got in there as part of that AI change readiness on a high performance. I went, oh, I like some of these kind of personas that we could potentially kind of go, what does that look like? And I know that Swoop kind of have theirs around you know, employee engagement, but I like these ones from an AI perspective. I thought there was some, they were some good ones to kind of come in, the AI skeptics. I mean, we all kind of get those. <laughs> now, there's a co-pilot for sales success kit that's actually come out. Um, I was having a bit of a click through. And look, although I don't necessarily go into the co-pilot for sales, often it's going into things like, you know, dynamics and other areas. I'll often go and have a look at them because there might be things that we can download and fill gaps. Sometimes there are different gaps that we've got across comms and we can use other content. As I was working my way through, there was a few things in there that I did particularly like. Um, th th some of the, you know, the top 10 in prompts, there's some good prompts, some little prompts in there that would be, I suppose, a little bit more generic over the over the board and not necessarily specifically to do with living in, you know, dynamics. Um, unfortunately, when I was trying to download the resources guide, it was asking for um, um your deal, DLP, and so it wasn't allowing you to pull it down. I sort of went, hey, guys, I'm not sure who to speak with. but And another one was with the getting started. Um, there was, uh, or I think it was the getting guide was not downloading, and the resources guide had a link in there around some of the change or journey, and you couldn't download it. It just went to a an error message. That's right. Um, so I've passed that on to the adoption team because they are putting this up on the adoption side. So, but there are some other content in there that's of value. Um, in the scenarios library, there is uh, lots of new content that's flowing right throughout. Um, they haven't stated in the release exactly what has gone up. But the one thing that I have noted that I did particularly like was there is a day in the life of, and it's going through, and it's not just about the IT. It's about people in particular across the Microsoft team, Day in the Life of Cynthia and Andrea, Josh, so Steve. So I did like these ones. So this is one of them. Josh, he's the internal comms manager and what he's doing here, a little, you know, lighthearted. Um, so there are some fun ones in there that um, I did like in the day of life of specific individuals and then it wasn't as generic. Okay, so I did like those. Um, there's the success kit that's now come out for small and medium business. It is very light on. Um, I We've got some of this content previously, I suppose, across other areas in adoption, but they've customized and tweaked it just a little for the small and medium business, um, including things like, you know, those emails that you can actually push out there and, you know, point if you're a partner on here, maybe point your smaller businesses to this adoption kit. They've tried to make it light so it's not as overwhelming. What I did like as part of this was, you know, some of those scenarios though are geared a little bit more to that sort of the day in the life of a, a small business. So I do like those. Yeah. There is a new uh, component in the adoption site, which is the Microsoft Copilot for service. So if you want to go in and have a look, you've got the kit that you can actually download. So you've got the Copilot success kit. There's this somewhat similar I suppose to what we've already got there um but it's uh, it's got some it's got some interesting content one to go in have a click around and a look at now one of them one of the components that I found was there was a there was a page that came up 
It is a manual. It's around transcription management in Copilot. Now, a lot of this is quite technical. Um, there's all this sort of technical content in there. However, for me, I'll often go and just have a bit of a quick scrim through and go, is there anything in particular? And I was like, well, yes, there is, because there are things that we do need to know in there around um, how a user is doing some of the things that they're actually doing to make sure that uh, they are doing the right thing when it comes to recording meetings, for example. But down the very end of the page, there is a what does Copilot with Transcript actually unlock or Copilot during the meeting? So it's kind of giving you, you know, what are the two different things to try and help us maybe even talk to our audience around, you know, Copilot and transcription and what's actually going on. Okay. There is, and last month I talked about the fact that Copilot are bringing out um two new themes when it comes to blogs that they're putting up and, and newsletters that they're putting up. One is a work smarter um, and another one is the grow your business. So for the SMB space, so they're putting one up. So the work smarter actually has three tip newsletters that have come out on Copilot productivity tips. There are, you know, screenshots of how you can do things and what do they look like and what are the prompts that you can do. Some great prompts in there for you to be able to work work your way through. So I would recommend having a look, some great prompts. Okay. So the Grow Your Business one, there is, um, it's now up and running. So Angela and the team are doing a fabulous job uh, in terms of the SMB space. And look, you know, a good portion, in fact, the vast majority of businesses in Australia are in the SMB space. So there is some good content in there. And it was the PKSHA technology organization and how they've actually embraced AI. Um, I do like it. It's got their use case, how to they do it, you know, a bit of a video and a little bit of fun there. Okay. So off the back of that, um, Emma said, uh, which of the co-pilots you recommend an essential for SMB starting out with AI? Uh, I would just say co-pilot for Microsoft 365 uh, and, you know, plugging that into their, their you know, SMB, you know, their business license to start with. I mean, there there's, there's lots of others. I mean, it depends. If they don't have Dynamics, they're probably not going to purchase that. If they don't have something else, then they probably wouldn't have purchased that either you know so it depends on what the extra technology is um if they're heavy core you know project management for example they might go purchase then the planner to include copilot as part of that although it is as we said it's in you know kind of preview version at the moment so but a lot of small businesses are um quite project heavy i find so it might be a real value for them to upgrade there um and, you know, it's often only for those that really need it. You'd have to be really careful on your licensing as to what you would purchase as well, Emma, because you often have a lot of frontline type workers that you might not need to be purchasing for. So be, you know, careful in terms of the licenses. It's very hard. It's a it's a what if, you know, what does it look like? And it's a it could be a any combination or scenario or frontline to <laughs> so that's a bit of a that's a bit of a tough one to to state. But you know, your office workers that might be going hardcore and you want to speed them up in productivity, definitely get your copilot for 365. Okay. All copilots. And yes, co poo little P Copilot. Yeah, Lorena. <laughs> I, I saw it and then I went, oh, I won't go into that one. But I, I as Lorena can't, can't, can't help it. Can't help it. I know. <laughs> uh, love it. Thank you. Okay. Now. Uh, another one is, and it does go through some technical. Available now is an assessment quick start guide in terms of risk in, in the business. Now, I say it's good for you to have a read through this. Do you need to know it in any particular massive depth? No, but as specialists, we also need to understand, you know, what are those risks when it comes to sort of AI and, you know, what what is it that we need to actually know? So, as part of that, you know, assessment quick start guide, um, have a look through. I do particularly like some of the question and answers. They tend to be the things that are of value for us because often we're creating things like FAQs going up on our L&D sites, things that we can actually answer. So when I put a lot of these up, it's because I kind of go, go look at those things because they're things that you can answer questions for your community. Not all of them are relevant for, you know, your end user, but we also have to think of the adoption for our 
a help desk as well. So sometimes we need to put this content up there for them as well. Okay. Um, in the new Microsoft Planner, what's new, what's coming? There's an AMA uh, coming up very soon. You can add it. Generally, it runs at around about one o'clock in the morning. I will put up the recording for you if you don't want to join it. Uh, but a good one that might actually help you off the back of um, uh, the session that we've just had with Lauren. The loop. Now, I have put up uh, yeah, thank you very much, Emma's daughter. I do appreciate you typing in. <laughs> oh, she's clarifying. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Hey. Now, in terms of the um, Loop Live, I had put up that you can join these live. They do run, of course, in the early hours of the morning. The recordings are now going up on demand, so you can actually go and watch them all on YouTube. Um, there is that five-part learning series. The first one was Meet the Makers. Um, then there's everything you want to know about Microsoft Loop. The next one is leveling up your project management with Loop. So how that actually then ties in potentially with some of the other, uh, such as Planner, because Planner and to-do are all kind of tying into Loop and just to make it all even more confusing and give us a little bit more FUD. <laughs> yeah, isn't that right, Lauren? <laughs> Where we just, um, I mean, the great part is it is so phenomenally um, interconnected and there's so much more that comes with it and you can't sort of untangle it so we have to think about how we train in a scenario and make sure that we kind of go day, that day in the life of and how you might put things and how it kind of ties together. Okay. Um, there is a meet the um, uh, meet copilot in loop that actually is coming up in uh, the next sort of 24 to 48 hours if you wanted to go and have a look at that session um, as I said it will be early as the morning I will put the recording when I've got it here for you next month now under the public sector site if you haven't actually been there before, it's got an Innovate Together section. And in there, it has a centre of sort of expertise around it. And there's a whole change agents program in there. There's some really good content to be able to help and support you when it comes to change agents. There is a course that you can actually go and do. It is a one hour module in terms of being change agents in the public sector around sort of that. There's one that's sort of in here around AI and focusing on, you know, change and adoption. Uh, look, anything that can actually help us, I think, is a value. And if you are in the public sector, something I would highly recommend if you haven't actually gone and have a look at this um, a centre of expertise that Microsoft have actually put in and the Innovate Together component, then I would recommend going and having a look. Um, and I see Beck has left. She's in kind of the public sector. Oh, Beck, you're going to have to watch the recording. <laughs> I, know, I know she's, you know, she's in the public sector. Another one, if you haven't actually seen it, you've got the innovation library that's in there as well. Now, I've been here a few times in the past. Um, it actually in there, there's a recommendation of different ways that you can extend the likes of kind of Microsoft Teams with things like the adoption bot, for example, the champions management platform. And there's you can go in and you can start to then have a look at, you know, how could you extend your, you know, Microsoft Teams or your environment with some of these extra bots and components okay they've also got in terms of the public sector the center of expertise now this is very much focused on ai with some good videos in there of how they're actually doing it across the public sector so if public sector fed and government and if they can actually be doing ai there's really not a lot that's actually stopping a lot of other organizations go in start learning from them because they're actually doing it really well and microsoft are helping and supporting them quite extensively so there's some really interesting information in there if you're not if you're sort of not con um if you're a little concerned around some of it okay microsoft have pulled together now a customer hub the Customer Hub is information and it's um, uh, live sessions that they've kind of been putting in sort of different places and they're kind of collated together now under one site where they've got the discover the different theories. So depending on what it is that you're focused on, if you are focused on, you know, teams, for example, or communications in teams. So if you're doing, um, you know, if you're dealing with phones, 
or are you dealing with, you know, extensibility? So this is going, you know, outside of plugging in Copilot Studio and all of the above or just the fundamentals. They've actually got all these on-demand sessions or sessions that you can actually register for. Um, there are plenty of different ones in there. I think on the next, yeah, the next page, here we go. So this one is for the Teams phone series. If you want to have a look and see what's actually coming up, some good sessions. Now, because it is in PT time, um, not going to be great for us, but you will be able to register and then watch the recording afterwards if you go register some good content. That's just one of them. There is all of the co-pilot ones as well. So um, another piece is in the Microsoft Teams section on the adoption side. It's got information around town halls. In there, it will show you the features now that are generally available because we've had that swap over from live events to town halls. What's actually coming down the line, if you wanted to know what was coming, they do have this live on their page, so you can always go in at any point and go and have a look. Okay. That's it. So the Total Economic Index which is often a Forrester-led research. They've now put out the impact around the new Microsoft Outlook for Windows. And I know Lorian is going the whole die, die in a deep hug hole in terms of Outlook. <laughs> uh, look, some of us, uh, look, it, it, it's a struggle. It is evolving, not evolving fast enough, in my opinion. Uh, too many things still missing, too much stuff for organisations that are causing a lot of challenges, especially in the back end. Um, but they've got some projections in there around some of the benefits off the back of it, some of those, you know, features and functionality, the projected benefits over three years, um, what does this look like? If you are moving over to the new Outlook and you don't have a lot of choice in terms of moving over to the new Outlook and you need to focus on some of the benefits, then these are some of the gains or maybe they want to push it forward and you've got to do a business case, for example, this might actually help you in your business case. You're going to, okay, Lorian, I'm waiting for him to come off mute. <laughs> there is no new Outlook. There's just Outlook web app There's in a wrapper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Microsoft Glint had their Ask the Expert sessions. What I do like about these sessions is the um, not necessarily if and if you've got Glint. What I particularly like about them is the fact that they've got lots of research in there because Glint is very much about sort of the science side, the people science side of things, and there's often some really interesting information in there. So one to go and have a look at. Um, one of those is some of their early learnings and best practices when it comes to um, um, uh, AI, for example, and what they're actually using it for. So some of the science behind it. Now, down the very bottom here is navigating Copilot, some of the um, slides here. One I'd recommend going and having a little bit of a look at. It's got some information, including this one here, common use cases. So if you want to make sure you're using the most common use cases on top of the training from some of the previous ones, this is what they're finding from a people science perspective. Okay. Um, they do have the session coming up around how Microsoft leverage Viva Insight. So this is the Microsoft side and how the scientists have done it to look at some of that impact around some organisational change. That's actually coming up fairly soon on September 11, which will be September 12. Uh, so, sorry, September 11, 1 a.m. Um, for us because it's in GMT time for them, which I think is like 10 a.m. So that's in when I registered. That's actually what it looks like for us. Uh -huh. uh, the Microsoft Teams. Now, I, I did, I think, last month, I think it was OneDrive, where they did a blog on learning content based on the on-demand from the um, uh, Microsoft 365 Community Conference, and they put together a playlist. We now have a playlist in terms of Microsoft Teams of all of the in-depth conference um, content, so it's just a blog for you to be able to go to. Uh, another one in terms of the community hub, a blog has actually gone on out there around Copilot and Intelligent Recap. What are the differences between sort of the two? What are you doing? How are you doing it? There is, I suppose, in terms of um, the page, 
quite a bit that's a little sort of in the technical space, but down towards the bottom a bit is this table. And it's in there that helps us to potentially explain the difference between Teams Premium and Copilot. You know, what are you actually getting and what's the difference between the two so it gives you a bit of an example that you could potentially use even for faq so i do like this um from to do what is it going to do capturing compared to staying on topic and authoring and insights for example so you know what's it doing and the way it's doing it now the insider blog i got a little confused because what happened was um the microsoft 365 insider blog is now there on the tech community and when i went in there it had like 20 new blogs for august 25 24 25 26 and i went oh geez the team's being busy and then i realized that no what's actually happened is where they had their own um uh, site, I suppose, underneath the Microsoft 365 banner, it had the Insider blog there. They've actually moved all of the blogs from there over into tech community. So it looks like they're all new, but they're not. Um, so I will, you know, for a bit, I'll be working out, you know, which is new, which is not new, but it is actually moving. So if you do go there, it is on its way. So after five years, it's moving over. Okay. There are some community calls that are actually coming up that you might wish to get involved in. Some of them I've actually talked about, some I may not have, but the vast portion I have kind of, you know, touched on. In the Viva events space, I've talked about um, the first one here, the impact of change. There is another one including the psychological safety of your team if you would like to register. Some of the what's new to 365. Let's move on. Now, Copilot. Let's have a look at some of the different Copilot features. Now, on some of the admin and management capabilities, generally I'll only bring some of those up if I think that they're going to help us from an adoption change perspective. Sort of like, you know, here, you know, sentiment surveys, going to be important. Okay. Let's go have a look at some of the features and functionality. First thing, an additional 12 languages, but what I particularly liked was improvements for Copilot around specific languages, like English UK. We still don't have English Australian, and that can actually cause us some issues in terms of Copilot. And please don't ask Microsoft Copilot to put in, put it in, you know, Australian English, otherwise it will go, you know, yeah, mate, shrimp on the barbie for you. <laughs> it goes full Aussie Ocker, so yeah, uh, it doesn't doesn't actually work. Um, it will work now a lot better if you do have English UK chosen rather than English US. So at least that's finally kind of coming up to speed a little bit more for us. Okay. Uh, a new one there is in terms of the Copilot dashboard. It is now Copilot is now integrating into Glint and pulse and it'll allow us in the reporting to be able to see that employee sentiment actually flowing through in terms of what's the impact where it comes to adoption of this uh, particular content so you can also start your pulse surveys for example directly in the copilot dashboard if you've got the permissions of course to be able to do that so you'll see here start the pulse survey directly from the reporting which will be interesting to be able to see this and you'll be able to view those results depending on where you are whether it doesn't matter whether you're in did a pulse or glint or over here you so you'll be able to see some of those results now don't forget though you will of course require that premium license to be able to do that because you're not going to get the likes of you know vivia glint or pulse without it okay. um Another one is there is uh, some improvements around Copilot being grounded a little bit more when it comes to chat. When you're pasting content, there is an increase from 2,000 characters to 16,000 characters. Yay! You know, there's a bit of hallelujah there. I do like that one. Um, another one is you can do the specified locations now, find my files in, rather than it kind of just being, you know, overarching. You can kind of direct it so it's now grounded in in um your so that OneDrive files chat 
where it looks like. Another one is over in Outlook. It's going to uh, do us a little bit more reason when it comes to where are you looking. It can be, you know, your archive or navigate to specific folders, for example, rather than just all that primary mailbox. So you can tell it, you know, kind of where folders and subfolders now. And um, there also is the grounded conversation in Teams chats so that you can actually find and use relevant info when you're crafting a prompt. So it's now grounded inside a particular chat as well. Okay. Uh, there is a, by the way, uh, if you're not sure what grounding is, if you're not, if you're not sure what that graph, graph grounded in chat, um, a great LinkedIn post that was actually put up there. I've forgotten the author's name, gone totally blank and all my blah, 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 blah. Um, but a um, really good uh, understanding of what does that actually mean. Now, not all of the information is necessarily completely up to date considering some of the stuff that we've just had now come out, but it will help people to at least understand, you know, what is it if you need to articulate it inside your business, okay? The pasting of content is a lot easier now in Copilot in Word with expanded paste options. So when you paste in, you can actually paste in as, you know, things like, you know, tables and you can easily reword it and transform it and list some of this stuff we've kind of seen before but you can see in your paste options here it's actually pasted in terms of as a table okay. next one quizzes so in forms now what it will actually do is so say you're in the education space for example if you're doing quiz you can have it where it gives solutions as well so possible explanation of the answers that they can immediately have um, a view of step by step of how to actually you know solve it there is a blog in regards to that as well if you want to go and read a little bit more in there it has all the step by steps where is the what's new is just an overarching kind of with a, a picture if you really want to have a look at those step by steps go down into the blog so with some with some great content and there are different things that they've done okay next one summarizing content over a specific period of time with copilot so now what they've got in your copilot is using time phrases such as um find me you know information from yesterday or last month or from six months ago or in december or particular dates these are things that you can now put in as prompts so summarize stuff from march i do like that one that in particular is going to be a um, bit of fun okay now Next is there is new prompt collections in both sales, finance, and the energy sector. So if you're going in and you want to have a look at it by job type, you do have different industries flowing in. So there'll be more and more that are actually coming. These are the first in terms of industry, okay? some of the industry type stuff, industry and then education. Okay? Another what's new to Copilot, um, there is a part one and part two series that have come out around a daily blog for different prompts that you can do inside Excel. I do like these because it gives just a it gives a screenshot and what you could type in a screenshot and kind of what you could be typing in. What does it actually look like and the results that it might actually give you? So every day they're kind of putting something in in I mean it's like a it's actually more like a summary, a one week summary with a day by day by day of things that they've kind of built and they put it up on a one pager. Okay. Um the next one is the part two. And one of those, for example, so if you've got, you want it to give an example of how to actually use a formula, um, this is one of the screenshots where it will give you, you know, tell me what it is and it will, you know, give you a bit of an idea of how to actually use it. So that's just one of those blog posts that will show you the pictures. Okay. Another one is, this one is a little controversial in that when you go into Microsoft Word and you've opened up a document, so coming very soon, it's going to automatically summarize your document for you. Now, up the very top, it's going to be taking up room up the top and you can press the view more button so it will be longer. Some people are already kind of stating, I don't like this. Every time I get in, I have to kind of collapse it and get it down because it takes up all this screen space. Can I turn it off? It's like, well, kind of no. <laughs> so um, 
Yeah, we're going to have people that love it and people that hate it. And uh, I personally like it. It gives me a bit of a summary of, you know, what it was, especially if it's opening up and it's someone else's document. Now, um, whether you've opened it and it's someone else's or it's yours, it's going to do some, you know, different things. So there's some of those tips and tricks around, you know, authoring. And um, if you open it out, then the next time you, um, if you close it and open, it will stay open, for example, compared to if you've collapsed it down and open it and close it, it'll stay collapse so it's we'll remember what you've done last okay, okay. Oh, actually in the very last one if you've made a change you can check new summary there's a button there we'll check new summary as well this one here it took me a moment to kind of get my head around the wording on the post was a little confusing as to what it was doing what happens is you know, because I'm kind of go, okay, shared channel. But if people aren't in a shared channel, they're not going to be able to see that it's a shared channel. So it's got a request to join a shared channel via a channel link. And the wording was set a bit like, I can see the channel, can I request to join? But it's really kind of not. If you're in the tenant, someone can send you a link to a shared channel, even though they aren't the owner. And then what you can do is you can click on the link and then it's got a join this channel button, which flicks off a message to the owner to go yes or no. Yes, they can, you know, join. So it was a, it, I was, it took me a moment. I'm kind of going, hang on a second. Does this mean everyone can now see shared channels and you could go, can I just join this channel? It's like, well, no, that's not kind of what it is doing um it took me it took me a little bit to untangle that one so it's more others can send you a link for you to be able to join okay. and they don't have to be the owner admitting like putting you in as a as a new user okay inside teams there is new channel cards you can actually hover over a channel name and what it's going to do so wherever that channel name happens to be mentioned when you hover over it, it will give descriptions and activities and memberships and names and give you access to things like your notification settings and channel owner management and rosters if you're doing rostering for example with you know the likes of you know whether it be Look, there's all the different technology in there. Um, so you'll see now, you'll see down the bottom here, links to channels, email address, leave the channel even, they have your settings up the top here. So this is a new little channel card that's coming into play. Another one is apps are now being supported in group chats with external users. Now, what I couldn't clarify in here was what apps and I think it comes down to some of the policies that are actually set by the business as to what apps are available for external parties but I couldn't find anything off the back of this new feature um, so not quite sure until we see a little bit more around it potentially as to what that looks like uh, you know when we think about we can already do planner with external users for example um, so I, I yeah. we'll see Okay. And the show high discover fee, we did talk about that last month. Town halls, you'll now be able to send and see reactions, things like like, laugh, applause. You'll see all the little icons and everything coming up in the bottom right hand corner that is part of a premium license. And now another component that I liked was with the town hall, you can export your Q&A questions to a CSV. Love it. It means that you might want to put them up on, for example, your Viva Engage or part of FAQs or as part of your, um, you might put them in to your stream you know you can download them put them up on pay all sorts of pages and things like that so do you like that another one that's been you know interesting for quite a while we've not been able to change the general channel now that is coming into play to be able to rename your general channel with this there is some caveats of course like all things some caveats two things it can be renamed by the teen owner. It then shows up in alphabetical order, like you do with all of the channels. So it will go into alphabetical order for all. Uh, you can kind of rename it apart from doing your, you know, clicking on your ellipsis button, your little three dots, you know, if you click on your ellipsis button to be able to rename a channel, you can kind of do it here. You can do it in your many channel settings as well as in the context menu too. So you can do it in a couple of different ways. But once you rename it, okay, 
So once you've renamed it, you cannot do a new channel and give it the name general. You can't do that. So once it's done, it's done. Okay, so you can't. Re and the first um, created channel in the new team will have the same description as the team by default. So what will happen is when you go to create a team, whatever that in that team name, name is, uh, you will also be able to come in and name the first channel directly from creating a team. Okay. So this gives you a little bit of control when you're, you know, creating that sort of team from here. Okay. There is now the new SharePoint design idea. So Microsoft design being more heavily embedded into the um, into SharePoint. What is that? Just like the way channels are now auto hiding in the process to see all channels. Yeah, it can be a bit of a struggle for people when uh, going in and making sure they push show to be able to kind of support them. Um, I think it's to try and reduce down some of the noise. If you're not going in there an awful lot, it's just doing an auto kind of hide because you're not going in there. I, I personally do a lot of pinning of things that are my favorite anyway. So it's not bothering me as much. But I get it. I have had it where it's frustrated me a few times too. And okay. um, the SharePoint design ID features. So what it actually happens is when you go into the toolbox, you'll see this little kind of, you know, flash, which is the designer flash to say you can improve the structure around design ideas. Now there's lots of different ones. In the, in the blog, if you go and have a look at the blog around the design ideas, this is just the very first one in terms of getting started. It's banner. It's um, um, so the web parts. It's different web parts, for example, whether you're doing a text or a blank or a, there's all these different areas where it will show different ideas of how you could actually display that to make your structure just a little bit prettier. Uh, so some of those, there's a, there's a blog, sorry, there's a video that's come out the team have put out there um, an introduction to these design ideas. One of the things that you need to be uh, aware of is it is only available in certain sections and components that you're actually working with at this point. So it does have some limitations in where you're going to see designer flowing into SharePoint. Okay, but do like the video one to go watch. Oh, the reason I have a blank page here. I kept it in there just to remind myself. The roadmap, the SharePoint roadmap that comes out every month, it seems to be coming out instead of at the end of the month, it's coming out kind of the beginning of the next month. By now I've often seen it, but we have no, you know, roadmap. So next month, <laughs> my very neat writing up on the screen, um, next month I'll probably have two months potentially. So it will be August's roadmap and potentially September's or September's roadmap and potentially October's. Who knows? It's it's changing a lot in terms of when they're bringing it out. Yeah. Um, the What's New to OneDrive, they've got their community call that you can actually go and watch. Uh, it was on August 21st. So if you want to see what's going on, there's the video. Um, what's New to Planner, there's auto resize. So you can gra drag and drop and increase the widths now of your columns in grid view when it comes to Planner in Teams. Another one is um, you can come in here now and as part of Planner, it's going to give you a new tab called Recommended. So it's going to highlight plans that tasks that have been assigned that you haven't actually viewed yet. So it's, if you haven't viewed it, it's going to do a recommended. So go here and kind of have a, have a bit of a view. Now, um, it'll only appear if there's been tasks that you haven't looked on your recent plans, okay? So it's only going to come up. So you're not going to see it there. So it's in context, basically. Okay. Now, some of the other improved functionality, when you go to copy a link to a plan and you paste it, now it's going to come up with the plan's name. Yay. So the one big, you know, kind of URL is going to come up with that plane. So it's a little bit cleaner and neater. What I found particularly interesting, and I have not seen it, and I mean, I have done a, you know, ton of training and I always go click on the ellipsis button because they've always called it the more, you know, getting in anything that's more functionality or more options kind of thing with the ellipsis button. Um, they've actually put in here, 
copy the link plan from the overflow menu. It's like, mm, I haven't heard it called that before, which I thought was an interesting one. So that's a, that's a first for me seeing it called the overflow menu. Use it if you wish to. Drag and drop in terms of lists. Hallelujah. Loving this. And there's also the ability to be able to have that custom order as well. Kind of you can save it as part of, you know, a bit of a drag and drop. Now, the reordering with drag and drop is also available in the board view as well as in your gallery view in lists to be able to do drag and dropping around. You know, we're used to doing that kind of the likes of planner, but it wasn't something that we necessarily had in Microsoft lists. So um, if you are a keyboard user, you can go into more actions and do it through there as well and move things up and down if you wish to okay good you'll need that sometimes for your accessibility features some functionality now in microsoft forms now this one is i suppose a little important there is the syncing changes that's actually come in now for Excel as part of the auto sort of syncing and making sure the functionality. So we have one book. For a while there, whenever you went and opened up a Microsoft form and you wanted to look at the results in Excel, it was generating in OneDrive a new Excel book every time for a while there. And I've talked about this in the past. Now, now what it's doing, it's one book and it's doing its proper sync. But what's happening is there is a bit of an update in terms of the solution around this. So if it was having old you know, data syncing, it's going to give you a bit of a notification to go update the sync in Excel. Okay, so it's got this update sync. If you opened up Excel, it's going to give you this update button to take you kind of to a new functionality. Now, what I've put here on the right hand side is the FAQs from the page. And I've just limited down as to, um, you know, what do we need to do and where could there be some issues? Like if it fails, restart Excel. If I don't own the form and it doesn't seem to be syncing properly, what do I do? Well, if you can't, if you know the form, I'm going to go the form moment. If you don't, you're going to have to call IT. Okay, these sorts of things. Once you've updated it, no, you can't go back to the old view. Um, there will be an email notification in terms of a particular form that you need to go and update it. So they will have that kind of come through if you're a, the old version. And then you can just click those links to be able to do it. But where it's a bit of a worry, I suppose, is if you have a form and it has more than 50,000 responses, can you create the new data sync for it? Well, it data syncs, but it's only going to do it for the most recent 50,000. So what happens then is all the past information, it's not actually going to be showing you that in your Excel book. You're going to have to, and it states in there, you might want to go in and copy and paste and bring it into your Excel document based on the new sync. So it's like, ah, I'm thinking <laughs> this this could be a bit of a worry if people are cleaning out or deleting content or um, maybe they don't have the old book on, it's not updated. So one to really keep a note of, especially if you've got really big forms, okay. In Viva Insights, new functionality has come in in terms of being able to give you trend lines. There's a couple of other core things that I particularly like. Um, it's got a co-pilot value calculator. Now, this is based on applying an average hourly rate. It's in US dollars of $72. So it's actually based on the Euro Bureau of Labor Statistics. Now, you can come in supposedly you can customize it. IT can go in and your global admin can go into Viva and supposedly do an update. We'll see. Um, but that it does go based on an average hourly rate. Gives you a bit of an idea of what value on your return on your investment based on the work that you're doing across Copilot. So there is some, uh, some good functionality in there when, it, when we've got our reporting to be able to look at how well we're doing. Okay. Uh, another one is there's some metric guidance for comparison going in. So we can actually compare groups, for example. It's best to get two somewhat similar groups, you know, employees with different um, similar, I should say, um, job functionalities and ranks. We can actually compare how they're actually doing. So there's sort of research-backed sort of metrics around your active user to your non-active user as to how they're going to be able to give you sort of a financial return on that investment. Okay, so there is a uh, ebook there to be able to help you understand how to be able to um, work with it in, in um, 
know the impacts because you've got your um, analytics side of things with a report type for a specific individual like your business analyst within uh, your organisation. So there are certain functionality that comes underneath those roles. Next one. You've now got the ability to give delegate access to your co-pilot dashboard to be able to see organizational insights. Okay, so that's coming in. Viva Connections for an individual now has these new cards that you can drop in so you can see, and some of them are kind of there by default, I found when I went in and, and I had a bit of a play, but the, some of the new cards that are there is your OneDrive. You've got then a quick links card, things that you want to plug in there as your own, for example. So this is your own Viva Connections um, um page, <laughs> site page, getting to the end of it. Okay. Um, and then over on the right, you've got this uh, playlist card as well. In Outlook, there are new accessibility and usability improvements coming into play, into including things like um, keyboard shortcuts, um, different tabs. You've got your alt button so you can then come up with the ability to navigate with your keyboard using your alt button they're finally coming into play in the new outlook uh, because accessibility was a big issue in terms of the new outlook but they are slowly bringing into play another one is the um auditory functionality when it comes to dictate is flowing in. You do have the ability to now be able to go in and pause, resume dictation, um, change some of those settings. You can use your, you know, alt tilde key. So that's your, you know, little dash, um, which is on your keyboard uh, on the top left hand, usually next to number one, you've got your tilde button or on the top left hand side, and, and it does support more than 50 languages when it comes to dictation. So that's flowing into the new Outlook. In Excel, there is a new trim range fun formula, removes empty rows in the range to be able to help and support you in terms of those, you know, leading and it helps to uh, on the functionality, especially when you've got, you know, lots of zeros that might then push out averages, for example, because you've got a ton of zeros or a ton on the other end, so you can trim either side. Another one, in terms of some of the functionality in Excel, we've got the ability to be able to, with Copilot, create custom charts and pivot tables. So it will now support lots of new um, uh, chart types to be able to build using your Copilot. Okay. Another one is text insight. So if you've got summary of data, maybe you did a Microsoft, uh, so you did a Forms, for example, and you've got open-ended uh, questions that you've actually asked. So you can actually ask now summarizing textual data results and look at things like tone and length and be able to adjust your prompt around it. I really like that one because, of course, I do a lot of surveys being in the change space. So um, being able to help me in Excel around that, gold. Mm -hmm. And past, I was often pasting it over into um, Word to be able to help me. But it's good to have it setting. So another one is filtering comments in Excel that are around whether it's resolved or active, ones that have got at mentioned. So you can see kind of little sort of filter button up in the top right hand corner. There is plenty that goes in in terms of the release notes. Um, I generally go in and have a little bit of a look because Sometimes there are features and functionality in here that they don't put into the blogs or it's things that needed to be fixed that you just don't see, for example, on the roadmap. Um, there's always little updates going on. There's lots more that I would like to see fixed, but it's always good to know that they are on it. Okay. Coming up very soon is the Microsoft Ignite conference. It's from it's in November from the 19th to the 22nd. That's, of course, in US time. Um, you can go over. It is in Chicago. Anyone want to be there or you've got to be in Chicago at the time, highly recommend. Great conference to actually be at. Um, I am traveling. I'm just going to be coming back from big trip overseas in Norway, so I won't be going. 
The Microsoft Events Catalog, always running different sessions. I recommend going in. I do have this filtered based on particular topics. I've got 365 Teams and Viva, for example. Um, that does include Copilot. So if there's any particular live trainings that you wish to go and be part of, Microsoft are running lots of events. Don't forget you've got your community days. These are community sessions run by the likes of MVPs and community members like myself out there. These are all over the world, including those that are run in Australia. Should you be traveling and you want to join any of them or um, yeah, they're, please feel free to go and have a look. My wheel is, of course, out there. I'm looking at an update fairly soon, working on that one. Uh, this is all standard information. My recording will go live on my Adoption YouTube channel, so that will get pushed out there. Um, Collab Talk got uh, some new videos that have actually gone up on there to go and have a look at. Don't forget, I did present and in a couple of months ago at the Copilot user group, it is on, um, I need to update, I thought I'd pull that picture up, it is on tomorrow afternoon here in Sydney at the Microsoft Reactor, so you could always go along, it's going to be the OneNote session. Okay, so it's actually got the Gilbertson brothers are coming along to speak. OneNote MVP is looking forward to that. All the different resource links, where do I find it, the user groups that are out there. Um, the video has gone live for last month on my YouTube channel. I thought I had taken it live and I hadn't, so it went up this morning. My apologies, everyone. <laughs> Um, what's happening next month, it'll be the first day of the month in terms of October. However, just so that you're aware, there will not be a November session. As I said, I am traveling. I am going on a holiday for three weeks. I'm going to go do the Northern Lights in Norway. I'm taking my disabled mother for another trip. She's got um, she's got the Northern Lights on her list of to do. So I'll be going off and helping her with traveling. So looking forward to that. So there won't be a November session unless someone else wants to run it for once. <laughs> And um, thank you everyone for coming along and being part of the session. I do appreciate those that always stay. I know that they are long sessions with all of the content that we've got. And I've even dropped off all the what's coming. That's just the adoption and what's new. And we're still hitting, you know, an hour and a half to two hours because this is moving so much faster than we ever thought. Um, the presentation is available for you to be able to go and see. Don't forget it is also in chat. If you um, if you need to go click on the link now, um, I've seen that Lorian has very kindly put his presentation to the chat for us. So um, I'll also drop that into the presentation for you to be able to grab a little bit later on. If anyone has any questions, thoughts, comments, please feel free to come off now. I will stop the recording um, if you would prefer to be asking and not on recording. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Let me come off the recording right now. Okay. Thank you.